Today we're talking in Acts chapter 27. Today and tonight we'll be in this passage of Scripture, two different thoughts. But today I want to speak to you about uh, problems that, that, uh, that bring us into a storm. And what are the reasons people go into storms? Now, not every storm that you and I go through is really our fault. There are some storms that you go through that's nothing you can blame. You can't blame yourself. can't blame your mom or your dad. Or it's just not, it's not your fault. That is true. But many storms are uh, self, self-created. How many have ever gone through a problem and it was totally your fault that you were in that problem, Okay. And the rest of you are a bunch of liars. I'm telling you that right now. Yes. All of us have, gone, have made decisions and they've really messed up our, uh, our life. And they brought us into a storm. And may I tell you something? Storms in difficult times of life that I manufacture myself, um, dreams are dissolved. A lot of things I wanted to happen don't happen. When I make bad decisions, it puts me into a storm. This storm did not have, the storm was going to happen, but they didn't have to be in the storm. But when you get yourself in, you make some bad decisions, and some of the dreams that you have for your future will be dissolved, like an Alka-Seltzer in a a glass of water. It's just going to go away. I don't want that to happen for me. I don't want that to happen for you. I think another thing is that uh, they become very costly. Resources are lost. If you put yourself in a storm that you're not supposed to be in, you put yourself, you make some bad decisions. I've done it. Resources are lost. Dreams are dissolved. Hope can become very difficult to find. You can find yourself in a hole of no hope, wondering, what in the world? How did I get this bad? How did it get this severe? In the book of Acts, chapter 27, those of you who maybe just joined us today, in our services, the book of Acts is a narrative that God tells us a story. The story of the early church, the young church before they got the New Testament of our Bible. But after Jesus went back to heaven, in chapter 1, Jesus goes back to heaven. Chapter 2, Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes down from heaven, and he comes into the believers. Then in chapter 3, they go out and begin telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, the church takes off and God begins to bless and begins to prosper the work of the Lord. Now, probably 22 years have gone by. And um, the main propagator that God used to the Gentile world to get the gospel was a guy named Saul, whose name would change to Paul. Saul was named after the king of Israel, the first king, and strong and valiant. Paul is a Gentile name, and it means little, small, not necessarily that strong, valiant man he once was, but someone who could relate. And he had now been on three missionary journeys. He had come back to Jerusalem to be a help to his brethren, to bring finances and testimonies, and he got arrested and attacked unnecessarily and uh, unjustly. But he spent two years of his life in a place called Caesarea. He had several people interview him, Felix being one, and he was prosecuted and brought and accused two different times, and none of it really uh, came out to anything. It was all false accusations. And then a guy named Festus got a hold of him, and he brought in King Agrippa and Bernice, and they quizzed him, and we've learned about that. But the two years have gone by, and in that time, they put him in a corner, and he appealed to Caesar, Nero. Now, Nero, he was a pretty good little leader for a while while he had some good influences, but he turned into a nasty, mean, arrogant, hateful man. He would eventually light Rome on fire himself or have it done and then blame Christians. And he would take them and dip them in oil and light them on fire to light the streets of Rome at nighttime. He, was, he became very cruel. He's the one who took the life of Peter. He's the one who took the life of Paul eventually. But uh, he, in his, in his calmer years, he said, Paul says, I, I appealed to Caesar. They were going to throw him back into a kangaroo court in Jerusalem with, his, with the Sanhedrin that already had a bias against him. So he says, I appealed to Caesar. And when he did, uh, now he's on his way. He is in Caesarea, which is on the, uh, the western shores of Israel, and now he is on his way to Rome. He's been given a guy who's in charge of him and multiple other prisoners. 
His name is Julius. He's a centurion. He has a hundred soldiers that work for him or are under his authority. That's why he's called a centurion, like century 100. He's in charge of them. And now he's been given the opportunity to take these prisoners in that region of the world and take them over to Rome and have them appear toward, uh, to, to, to Caesar and, be, ju- and be, uh, be judged and prosecuted there. It's a very serious thing, and it was, it was challenging. Matter of fact, it's so serious. If you had a prisoner given to you, however many prisoners you're supposed to take, uh, if you took 50, you've got to turn in all 50 of them, dead or alive. You either brought them in alive or you brought them in a box. And if you didn't bring all 50 of them back, you had to give a life of one of your soldiers for the one that's missing. So it's pretty serious responsibility. Well, Julius has now been given the job of taking care of Paul and making sure he goes. Now, Paul gets two men to come with him, Aristarchus and Luke. Luke is a longtime physician, probably from Philippi originally, maybe from another area of Macedonia, but he's a physician, and he has cared for Paul, and he has been in his shadow for the least uh, the trip all the way from, from uh, Macedonia to Jerusalem, and while he has been incarcerated in Caesarea, probably ministering to him, and writing two books of the Bible, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So the Apostle Paul is now traveling, and two men... Maybe they perceive them as being slaves of the Apostle Paul, which may have given him a little more credence. He is a Roman citizen, and, uh, and it seems like that Julius, from the very beginning, this centurion, uh, had been filled in that this guy is not a hardened criminal. He's a good man in a bad situation. He's been accused unjustly, and he's been prosecuted without reason. And it looks like to them, early from the very beginning, this guy Julius has uh, built a relationship with Paul. He has to do his job, but he loves him, and it seems like he cares for him. And he gives him some, uh, really, some, um, some very favorable things. At one port he goes into, he puts him on a ship, and they're going to, to Rome. He lets him receive friends from a place called Sida, where he had started a church years ago. Those friends came to visit him and gave him maybe money or gave him food or gave him a care package of some sort. He allowed him to go and uh, take care of them with Luke and Aristarchus. And I think in this passage of Scripture, in this this chapter 27, you see the value of good friends. How many have good friends and you value them and appreciate them? How many want to be a good friend? You want to be a good friend to somebody else? Well, Aristarchus and Luke, man, these guys are special guys, but they're going to go into a storm with the Apostle Paul. Julius has got a job. He's going to take these prisoners, including Paul, to Rome. He gets them on a couple of ships, and I won't take time to go everywhere, but he gets them first of all and sails to a place. But it's the fall of the year. It's the fall of the year, and and like if you were to live in in Florida, uh, the Gulf Shores, during the fall of the year, what happens in August and September? We just found out that Ian happens, right? (laughs) They have storms that come up. In the Mediterranean Sea, that was one of the challenges. It was not a good time to be out on the waters in the month of October. They had just finished the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur had come through, and now it's this time of year. That will happen this week for the Jewish nation. But now they just finished that, and the storms were begin, been going. And they found themselves parked at a place called the Fair Havens. It was a good name for itself. It was a place of safety to some extent, but it wasn't a good place to stay a long time. And uh, the owner of the ship, they had gotten a hold of an Egyptian ship with a large grain ship, And they put their prisoners on that. There's 276 passengers in all, including the captain and owner of the ship, the the, the soldiers, the, the, the folks who work on the ship, the shipmen, and the passengers. There's 276 of them on this very large grain ship. And they're sitting in the fair havens, but it's not a comfortable thing. It's October, and they want to get out of there, at least go to Crete. Because at Crete, they have a a place called Phoenix there, which is a port that's a little bit more, probably better nightlife, (laughs) probably better place for people to go in and find something to eat and things of that nature. And they're sitting here in the Fair Havens, and uh, Paul is uh, is there. And uh, the news is, we got to get up and leave. We can't stay here. We're going to keep moving. Let's keep going. And God shares with Paul something very important. Let's look, if we can, please, in the Scriptures, chapter 27. 
And uh, if we look at verse number six, and there the centurion found a trip of Alexander sailing to Italy, and he put us there on. So this, uh, this Julius uh, centurion, he put him on a ship. He has money from the Roman government. He's taking these prisoners. He's been given resources to do so. And when he had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, uh, sailed under Crete over against uh, Salome. And so they went to this place, and they, they passed by, and hardly passing it, came to a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereinto was the city of Lysaia, near the city of Lysaia. It was in the port there. Notice verse number 9. Now, when much time was spent, and the sailing was now dangerous because the fast, or that Yom Kippur, that uh, Day of Atonement, has now already passed, Paul admonished them. Here's what he said. Verse number 10, read it out loud with me, would you please? Chapter 27, verse 10, everyone. And said unto them, sirs, I pursue, not only for the lady and the ship. All right. So we find here that after they had stayed there for many days, uh, Paul heard when they were going to go. He says, guys, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea we leave. I, sirs, I, I warn you, I think if we leave, it's not only going to bring much damage to the ship and to the cargo, but to our own lives. I think we shouldn't go. And now the only man on that ship who, and he had been to other, he'd been on many sails. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll find that this wasn't his first rodeo. <laughs> he, had been, he had been a night and a day in the deep. He had been several times on many ships throughout the Mediterranean. And he says to them, based upon his experience and probably based upon the Spirit of God on the inside of them, on him, he says, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. Let's, let's not go. However, would you look at the first word of the next verse? Verse number 11. What's the first word you see there? Nevertheless, however, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So we find here, uh, they're getting ready to leave this fair havens. It's not a good idea. According to the Apostle Paul, he says, I don't think it's a good idea to leave. And nevertheless, the, the centurion said, you know, I've talked to the owner and I've talked to the, sh the ship captain and they think it's good. I'm going to believe them. And boy, you know, uh, friends, let me just encourage you to consider, be careful who you listen to. You know, most people believe Darwin over Moses. They believe, this, they believe what Mr. Darwin said rather than what Moses said in Genesis 1.1 and what God told Moses to say. Most people will believe a scientist over a saint. They'll believe the expert. Who is the expert here? Mr. Fauci is the expert, right? Okay, now calm down, calm down. Don't get excited. We believe the science. What's the science say? Rather than God's God's instrument here in the Apostle Paul. It's interesting, he says, you know what, I've talked to the captain and I've talked to the owner, he's got the most to lose, he thinks we ought to go. And they do. And you'll see several things. This decision causes a tremendous amount of hurt and difficulty. And yet, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. God can take the failures of man and still bring a lot of blessing in a situation. We see that in the story. Let's continue if we can, please. Verse number 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, it wasn't a comfortable surrounding. The circumstances were not favorable. And the more part, more people advised to depart from that. The majority felt like it was better for us to go. If by any means they might attain to Phoenix or to Phoenix and uh, there to winter, which is the haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and the northwest, where the winds will blow favorably. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. I want to talk to you for a few moments. We'll stop with that uh, for right now. Tonight we'll come into some other, other areas I think will be very helpful. We can learn from things there. And here we find a bad decision is made. And it, it was made for five reasons. You know, everybody has to make decisions. Decisions determine destiny. What you decide to do with your time, your efforts, your energy, your future, your career, all that stuff is going gonna, gonna to make a determination of where you're going to be. You're going to decide what friends you're going to keep. 
Now, when you have a decision to make, there is, there's obvious a logical thing going on inside of you. There's a, there's, a, there's a something that says, okay, this logically is what I should do. There should be, if for a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God, a, a voice of intuition, a voice of conviction, conviction that comes. There's some things that are very logical. May I say to you, God is not always convenient, and he's not always logical in your decisions. If you only go with logic, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. God has given you something else, and that's the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. But he's given one more thing to help us, and this is the game changer, and that is what God's Word says. Every once in a while, I'll find someone who wants to marry someone who is not a Christian. And they'll say, well, logically, we get along together. We haven't had any problems. I feel good about it. But you know, the Bible tells us not to do that. Not to do it because he said, be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. So I don't care how good you feel about something and how I've had people say, well, I just, I'm living with my boyfriend and I know it's not, it's not, I, I, I know that you think it's not right, pastor, but I just, me and God, we're okay with it. We feel good about it. And you know, the truth of the matter is, a heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked could know it. You don't have to wonder whether you should steal or not. You don't have to wonder if you're going to be a fornicator or not. God's already told you what that is. And that third part's very important. And God's man had spoken. Now, at that time, there may, not, there may have been some kindness offered to Paul, but there wasn't a lot of respect given to him. His opinion didn't seem to matter. May I say to you, the rest of his trip, his opinion mattered a lot. If you read the rest of the chapter, you'll find out whenever he spoke, he was like E.F. Hutton. People listen. <laughs> some of you young people have no idea what I just now said there. <laughs> E.F. Hutton has gone the way of man a long time ago, hadn't he? Nonetheless, uh, when he spoke later on, they were listening. But this time, they said, nah, we'll just listen to the captain. And there are five reasons that oftentimes affect our decisions. Number one, after they had been there many days, there is a compulsion that takes place while we're waiting sometimes. Like, how long am I going to be single? Good night. I've been waiting for this job. Come on. And after time goes by, oftentimes, we oftentimes become very impetuous. And we think, well, i got to make a decision right now. I remember years ago buying a car that I should not have ever bought. I was taking the train in Long Beach, and Linda had one car, and I needed another car. And we, we, I had some money saved up for that car. And it just, the right car wasn't coming fast enough for me. I remember waking up one Saturday morning, and I said to myself, when I come to bed tonight, I'm going to have a car. I don't care. And I started looking after I went soul winning and doing things. I started looking for a car. I found a car. Oh, I was so excited. I met the owner. I drove the car. It sounded pretty good. And uh, that night, I drove home with the keys and the title to a, a car. It wasn't a new car, but it was a car. And boy, I was so proud of it until it started breaking down. It became the most expensive car I think I've ever owned. Not what I paid for it when I bought it, but how I paid for it as it, it broke the rest, of, the rest of the time I ever had that car. That car became very expensive to me. And every time I had to fix it, I had to remind myself, that was my car. <laughs> Someone else is driving around with a car I'm supposed to have. <laughs> and God had to give it to somebody else because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. How many of you ever have a story like that? Where you just, like, I'm getting this done today. And sometimes it's because we feel pressure, compulsion. You know, if, I, if you're finding, man, the Spirit of God leads you. He doesn't push you. He, he leads you. God is a shepherd. He doesn't drive us. He leads us into paths of righteousness. And every once in a while, people make bad decisions under pressure. Sometimes I've get on the phone with someone and say, if you don't buy this now, it won't be available tomorrow. Sorry, you know, you've you got to do it now. What's your, where's your, what's your credit card number? If I didn't learn something right there, stop and say, No. Thank you very much, and God bless you, and have a wonderful life. <laughs> if the pressure is on for that moment, be careful, because a lot of bad decisions are made under compulsion. Someone has got pressure on you to do things. I think these folks have been camping here a long time, and the owner in particular, and the ship captain in particular, while it was sitting in the harbor, it wasn't making any money. And they wanted to get that out of the harbor and make it down the, get it down the, down, down the shores and make their way to Rome where they could cash in that grain and make some money. And that's another thing. Sometimes compensation 
causes people to make bad decisions. They want more money. They want a better situation financially. Now, all of us think about money every day. I think about money. You think about money. If you're up an hour tomorrow, you'll think about money again. But it's not a good decision maker for us. Now, God will use finances to decide what you should do, what you shouldn't do sometimes. Now, I don't like that. Because if there's no money, there's no funny. <laughs> Nowadays, people that don't have any money, they go, dun dun da charge. I've got Visa. I've got MasterCard. And you need to do plastic surgery and cut it up. <laughs> well, I've got a MasterCard. I'm the master. No clown. They, you, they become your master. Getting in debt discourages you, distresses you. Someone said being in debt, getting in debt is kind of like wet in your bed. It feels good for a second, but don't do it. <laughs> It'll mess you up. It'll cause you all kinds of problems. But oftentimes people make decisions based upon compensation. Is it good for me financially? And certainly these men wanted to sail because they were wasting money sitting in the harbor. Some people make bad decisions because of compulsion. And then we find here... Another reason they made bad decisions, it wasn't commodious to spend time there. It wasn't comfortable. Some of you right now, you're in an uncomfortable place. It's not easy being you. Right now, there's loneliness, there's pressure, there's frustration. And you're not comfortable. And some people jump from the frying pan to the fire. Because something's not comfortable where we are. You know what it got real uncomfortable? When they got out on the water. And they ran into a thing called Eurycliden. It's another word for Ian. <laughs> okay? When they ran into this storm, that's when it got uncomfortable. That's when they were crying out and all hope they should be saved was taken away. They actually thought it was pretty miserable there in the harbor of Fair Havens, but it wasn't as miserable as it was going to be because of a bad decision. Some people make bad decisions because of compulsion. And if you're being pressured to make something that, that's not God's will, be careful. Some people make bad decisions because of compensation. They just, they want to be better financially. And some people just say, yes, I'm just not comfortable. I don't care. I'll take my chances. You may not want to do that. And then the Bible says they, they got counsel. The more part, the more part believed, it was a majority. Let me just tell you, Christian, the majority in this world is usually the wrong in the situation. The Bible says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be. Few there be that go to, into life eternal. Few there be that find it. It's the narrow group. It's the narrow group. And by the way, if you're going to be a child of God, you're going to be a faithful child of God, you're going to have to learn to be okay with the minority. Because most people are going the wrong direction, in the hand, and they're going to hell in a handbasket. They got the counsel of the, of the, of the wrong people. Now, some of you, you, you don't trust God's word and God's counsel. So you want to go find a psychiatrist somewhere. You want someone to give you pills for your peace instead of, instead of principles for your peace. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong. No, there, there are some situations that might do. But some of you, you're like, oh, yeah, well, that's the church. That's fine. I know what pastor says. I know what my Sunday school teacher teaches and that. But I need to hear from someone who really understands psychology. You might want to be careful about that. You might want to be careful about who you listen to. You get all your information from Facebook and from Instagram and MySpace and in your face and every place that you want to find some, somebody to talk to you about something. Let me tell you something. Everything you need, God has baked everything we need in our Christian life in the local church and in the Word of God. If you have a Bible, you have the Holy Spirit, you have a local church, you got everything you need to weather the difficulties of life if we do our job. If you got a Bible, love your Bible. It has everything. God has left no stone unturned. Everything you need to know about life and, and happiness and success, as a, as, and there's just nothing, there's nothing that God does not speak to you about. He speaks about sexuality. He speaks about marriage. He speaks about finances. He speaks about business. You, you, would be, you would be revolutionized if you took the 34 chapters of the book of Proverbs and read those and apply those principles. God, and that's just one book of 66 books here. He tells you how to behave yourself as a friend, as a neighbor. 
as a son, as a daughter, as a wife, as a husband. Hey, listen, general principles are there, but a bad decision because they made bad counsel. They took the counsel of somebody that uh, was not familiar with the Scriptures and was not familiar with the God of the Scriptures, and Paul did. Bad decisions are oftentimes made because of compulsion, because of compensation. Bad decisions are made because of comfort. I'm discomfortable right now, so i got to decide something. You might want to just stay another, another day. You might want to be careful. Bad decisions are made because of bad counsel. And then I find, if you would please, if you look at just quickly, and we'll conclude, but verse, number, verse number 13. Read that first line or half or so. With, and when the south wind blew, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Verse 14, and not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon, a storm from Europe came through. The Bible tells us here they, they were sitting there contemplating all the decisions, and then a soft wind came through. And they thought, oh, this is our time. And sometimes you can't judge things based upon circumstances. What you, what you can see. Sometimes you say, you know what, if I, if I do this, God tells me this, if I do this, I'm not sure it's going to work out. Sometimes the circumstances, and they, they got something favorable. By the way, who can blow some wind? Can God bring a wind? Yes. Can the devil bring wind? Yes. He saw the soft wind. They said, oh, here's our time. Let's go. Let's lift up anchors. Let's unhook from the, un- unhook from the lock, uh, from, the, from the, uh, the, uh, port, and let's go from the dock, and let's make our way. And they did, and they ran right into a storm. I don't know about you, but I want to stay as far out of storms I'm, that are complicated by me as I possibly can. I'm going to have storms. Everybody goes through storms. But don't go through a storm that's your fault because you made decisions on compulsion, on compensation, on bad counsel, on just, I want to be comfortable. Listen, there is not a Bible verse in the Bible that tells you that you deserve to be comfortable. Well, I deserve to have better than this. Listen, that's not a Bible verse. Now, Nobody has a breakneck, terrible life from start to finish. But we will have some storms. You will have some times of discomfort. Don't let times of discomfort cause you to do something dumb. Don't listen to wrong counsel. And don't just evaluate every circumstance and say, this is what I need to do because I feel a soft wind. It just happened that way. Because sometimes it's not God that brings that soft wind. Sometimes it's Satan. May God help us to keep these thoughts into into place. I don't know about you, but if decisions determine destiny, I want to have a good destiny. So does God. He wants that for you. Let's pray together, can we?